Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Lindsay Lewis. I'm a UW dance alumna. I currently live in New York City, and I do fundraising for local nonprofits, uh, and soon I'll be starting graduate school in clinical social work. Uh, I'm originally from Muskego, Wisconsin. Uh, so during the month of May, Badger Talks Live will be showcasing teaching talent from the UW-Madison Dance Department, which is the first school in the country offering a collegiate dance degree. I'm pleased to introduce my mentor and professor of dance, Kate Corby. Uh, today, she will, she will be exploring the possibilities of dance as a vehicle for personal, interpersonal, and community transformation. Described by the Chicago Tribune as compelling and full of gestured conflict and impish daring, Kate's dance works have been seen extensively both nationally and internationally. Featured in Dance Magazine as one of six choreographers on the cusp of making waves in the larger dance world, she is the co-founder and co-director of Performing Ourselves, which is a community dance program based in Madison and employs undergraduate dance students and recent alumni to teach a movement and wellness curriculum in local community centers and schools. Kate spent much of her childhood in rural Wisconsin and graduated from Three Lakes High School in Oneida County. Uh, and Kate will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to post in the chat at any time. Uh, please welcome Kate Corby. Thanks, Lindsay. One of the best parts of being a dance professor is getting to watch our students transform over time and then getting having the opportunity to observe them in their careers. And I'm really excited for Lindsay because she just applied to four graduate programs in clinical social work and was accepted into all of them and will start at Smith College in June. So congratulations, Lindsay. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, my journey and my work with dance in relationship to self, other, and community. And I'm gonna do this mostly through talking about my creative work. So uh, choreographic works for the stage and screen dance works for film. But I'd like to start out just with a short um, ref reflective awareness exercise for all of us. And I invite you to participate in any way that you would like. I'm going to do it seated in my office chair, um, but you could also do this standing. So the object of this is to tap into our breath and tap into our senses just for a few minutes to offer an opportunity for introspection and reflection. So I invite you, if you're sitting, to find your sit bones, the bony part of uh, the bottom of your pelvis. And if it feels comfortable to you, go ahead and close the eyes. If that feels uncomfortable to you, you can have a soft visual focus. And bring your attention to your breath. Observing an inhale through your nose and an exhale through the mouth. And inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. Take a few more breath cycles on your own. And without judgment, tracking that inhale and exhale. And keep the focus on the breath while you simultaneously begin to notice your feet. Maybe you have bare feet, perhaps you're wearing socks, maybe you have shoes. Noticing your feet against the floor, either standing or sitting. And see if you can spread out your feet just a bit connecting back to the floor a little bit more. Feeling energy coming up from the floor as you continue to track the breath, inhale and exhale. And then bring the attention to the crown of your head perhaps allowing for a little bit more length 
in between the bones of your neck, your vertebrae. Maybe you just imagine your head lifting off of your spine ever so slightly. Still breathing deeply, allowing the abdomen and the ribs to expand and contract with a few more breaths. and opening the eyes if they've been closed. You can begin to shake out your hands, your face and your body. And reflect a little on how that feels if you feel any differently than you did a few minutes ago, if anything came up. Well, now um, I'm gonna bring you to my good friend, Lather Paul. Uh, Lather Paul here is, um, where I'm located on University Ave, 1050 University Ave. This building was open in 1910 and it was originally the home to women's physical education. We started offering dance in this building in 1916. And we, as you heard in my bio, were the home of the first degree in dance and higher education in 1926, founded by Margaret Dobler. Um, I have had the great privilege of being on this campus and uh, teaching dance and choreography since 2008. And um, I am uh, gr greatly inspired, as I discussed earlier, about my, by my students every day, constantly learning and in um, continuous conversation about the possibilities of, of the work that we do here. A number of our students are double majors, and so they're, they're bringing in information from their other courses of study in a way that is uh, really inspiring and often challenging. And um, I look forward to coming to work every day, which you know I, I think a lot of people on this campus can say, but I feel particularly lucky to be able to um, come to this building. Another... Um, Large part of my work is through Performing Ourselves, which is a community outreach program. You heard a little bit about it in my bio. Performing Ourselves was founded, co-founded by myself and Dr. Mariah Lefebvre in 2012. It started as a pilot program at Kennedy Heights Community Center and um, later expanded up to serving up to nine community center sites across uh, Madison. Uh, since 2012, we have served approximately 1,000 youth, ages 4 to um, 18, mostly in the elementary range. And we now uh, work in both community centers and uh, elementary schools. We are part of a larger collective called the UW Community Arts Collaboratory, which um, encompasses uh, visual art, theater arts, and music, and is um, run through the Office of Professional Learning and Community Education here on campus. Performing ourselves, although a service and outreach program for me, um, constantly influences my own creative work and just my personal philosophy about how to have a, a more human-centered approach in um, everything that we do. And I, I'm largely grateful for all the past students um, and employees of Performing Ourselves, including uh, our, our recent um, communications, um, sorry, our recent manager, Mary Patterson, who is also a dance movement therapist. Kate Corby and Dancers is the vehicle through which I uh, make my creative work. And I have um, been running this company in some way, shape or form since, um, oh, probably the year 2000. So KCND in the Midwest started in 2009. Uh, the dancers are based primarily in Chicago. Um, and I have um, been working with a couple members uh, of KCND basically um, since 2010. The work again is human centered and highly collaborative. So very specific to the people in the room. Um, and I ask my, myself and my collaborators to dig deep into their own personal experiences. And we use those in relationship to one another to create movement material. 
Today, I'm mostly going to talk about how we use partnering uh, to communicate human interactions. And I'm going to first discuss our work from 2011 called In Whole or In Part. It is an evening length work that was created in collaboration with visual artist Orit Ben Shitrit. The title is taken from the United Nations 1948 definition of genocide, and it explores genocidal violence through a community that transitions from peace to crisis. This was a two year project that began in a granular way, looking at mirror neurons and empathy, try, trying to get at the root um, of human violence and what, what are these, these urges and these impetuses and, and how are they encouraged throughout um, various communities. The work, as I might have just mentioned, uses partnering or lifting a human contact, dancer contact, as a metaphor for interpersonal interaction, the tone of which drastically changes over as the work progresses. It's approximately 45 minutes long. Um, to, today, we're going to see the first four minutes of the dance, which offers a nearly utopian series of weight sharing interactions. Um, so we're going um, to begin with the first clip, which is at the beginning of the dance and features Emily Miller, Mikey Rue, Matthew McMahon, and Michelle Sherlock Jensen. So this is in whole or in part.
And we are now transitioning to approximately the middle of in whole or in part. And this is a section in the dance where the community is has escalating tensions that that actually you know are explosive. Uh, as you watch this, I, I invite you to think about how the first of all to observe the interactions between the dancers, the the way that they're holding and lifting and pushing one another, the attitude uh, through which they're doing that, and and how those those attitudes and and how their actions might make you feel as a viewer. So here is the middle of in whole or in part. <laughs> Opportunity to return to some of these concepts from in whole or in part pretty recently as part of a collaborative work with nine UW dance majors. It was a repertory class and that's part of the dance major here. The piece was called A Return to a Brighter World and it premiered in February of 2022. It was significant both in process and product because it was a first return to touch for most of us since the beginning of the pandemic. And the work actually in opposition to in whole or in part begins with dancers moving in isolation, not connecting with one another visually or physically, and eventually transitioning to a series of highly challenging and supportive lifts, lifts with lots of energy and cohesion. The costumes are intentionally bright and the attitude of the dancers is, uh, is highly supportive and collaborative. Uh, I'm not going to share a video from this piece today, but I did want to share a quote from one of the students, Ella, who wrote um, in a reflective essay about the process, quote, one concept that we have worked on a lot in rehearsals is the idea of supportive rather than combative. The piece is about supporting each other and through our partner work, we are weight sharing and listening to each other to show support and solidarity. 
some of the choreography feels a little combative on its own. It was just the way that we created it. It has been a challenge to take partner work and make it appear supportive all the time. One thing that has helped me keep support throughout is the use of my breath. If I lean into my breath and breathe with the people I am dancing with, it feels more cohesive. It slows me down and makes me feel more connected to the group. Another way I have worked to make the weight sharing supportive is to lean into my partners when I am giving them my weight and when I am tossing someone to another lift. I make it slow and safe rather than pushing them away as if I'm trying to get rid of them." End quote. Ella's quote is really salient for me because it could be talking about something as specific as making a dance for the stage, but it also could be talking about being in relationship to one another. And as a group, as I led the group through um, conversations about how we wanted to be in the world with one another again, and what type of world we wanted to, to build, to rebuild, um, I, I was struck, as I often am, about the power of the creative process to have some pretty uh, intense conversations about larger issues and, and about our lives and how to make dance relevant um, to our everyday. I'm going to go back in time a little bit to 2015 to discuss uh, my first film project, Hunger's Beach which is a film investigating memory, trauma, and the power of place. It involves a small beach and cottage, uh, which provide a backdrop for a woman in distress, haunted by images of her younger self and the inescapable weight of loss. It was made in one week through a residency at Experimental Film Virginia. A highly intense process. And it, at the time I didn't uh, realize that these themes that I instinctively began to explore, uh, in, inspired by this um, town in Virginia, I didn't realize that these themes would be so influential and were, would be so important to my, my future work, specifically um, memory and uh, looking at, at trauma in relationship to child development. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that the energy of making a film and the collaboration necessary is um, unlike anything else I've ever experienced, and particularly in this intensive an environment and a time crunch environment. Um, so the, the credits will be at, at the end. So um, the, we, I'll be able to acknowledge all the wonderful people that worked on um, Hunger Speech. So it's about a little bit over three minutes, and we're going to get to see it in its entirety. It um, has screened at numerous festivals all over the the world actually um, and uh, continues to be screened and um, I hope you enjoy it.
Hunger's Beach was my first attempt at working creatively with children in an intergenerational cast. Again, I didn't really know it was happening at the time or why I was leaning into it, but it really planted a seed for my current work, which is uh, called Dance Like a Man, which premiered on stage in 2019. It's a duet that explores the male dancing body as a site for complex questions surrounding power, misogyny, heteronormativity, and childhood gen gender identity formation. It was made in collaboration with performers Josh Anderson and Mikey Rue. In the pandemic, uh, faced with not being able to continue to develop this work in person, uh, we started to work on the film version of Dance Like a Man, which um, includes two youth performers named Milo and Walter that play the younger versions of Mikey Rue and Josh Anderson. We're currently in post-production. We did uh, shoot this in entire film here in Madison and in Fitchburg. And this um, I, um, version of the work is in the collaboration with local filmmaker, Aaron Granite, local sound designer, Tim Russell, and Tennessee-based dramaturg and dance artist, Marcus Hayes. So today um, we're going to show the draft version of um, the film version, the end, the last four minutes of Dance Like a Man with Mikey Rue, Josh Anderson, Milo and Walter, the youth performers. Uh, the, I recruited Milo and Walter through my kids' school lives, which for me has been great to have that integration. Um, and it's also a really nice reminder that we need to finish the film when I run into Milo at drop off. So. Thanks, Milo. If you're listening, well, you should be in school. Um, this is not music by Tim Russell. This is the piece of music by Colleen, the artist Colleen that we use in the stage version um, to present in this draft. So now we will see the draft form of the final four minutes of Dance Like a Man. Thank you. 
Wow, that was phenomenal. And thank you so much, Kate, for sharing all wow, of that was your interesting phenomenal. work with and us today. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing all wow, of that was your interesting. You're with me a second. My audio is doubling up. There. That was exciting. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> so uh, hi, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. We're talking with Kate Corby, a professor of dance at UW-Madison, and we're wrapping up our month-long series uh, focused on the UW Dance Department. Um, feel free to post any questions you have for Kate in the chat. And gosh, Kate, where do I start with questions? Um, so your dance like a man example, I know you had talked in your podcast, we had a great podcast episode with Ben Rush that Kate talked with Ben uh, last week. You talked about societal expectations about dance. Um, and then I just see that exemplified, I think, in a lot of your work, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, particularly, I'll focus on gender first, and, and I will say that in the, um, more recently, the field of dance in, in general has created, created more space to push against binaries, uh, but historically in European traditions, the um, dance in ballet was highly gendered. So men lift and women get lifted to, to be a little bit reductive about it. And with Mikey and Josh, we had an opportunity to investigate their past and, and their experiences with dance and, and which were largely positions of privilege as, um, as, as men working in dance, as white men working in dance. But also some really destructive things came up too. Um, to a lot of overwork and, and this idea of pushing through and con constantly having to lift uh, one another and, and to lift women. And so the question became like, well, when do, when do other people get to take my weight? When, when do I get to surrender? When do I get to be vulnerable? And you know, at, at the time I had, um, had the great privilege of becoming um, a parent to both uh, a, a biological boy and a biological girl so far. Uh, and so it, I um, ended up with a large collection of He-Man toys that um, were my, my husband's ended up in our basement. And I want, and GI Joe as well. And I didn't want my son, to, I knew I didn't want my son to have anything to do with them. I didn't, couldn't really articulate why I wanted them out of the house so, so badly. I think He-Man is pretty fascinating. Uh, so I brought them to rehearsal and we, we started playing with them. And uh, in the longer version and in the live version, the, the dolls really um, offer a lot of information, a lot of signifiers about what Mikey and Josh are going through and the, and the exploration of, of their paths as dancers, but also as children. That was a long winded answer, but no, no, I appreciate that. And um, I have to say, um, with all of the wonderful faculty that we've showcased this month, I'm impressed um, by the work that all of you are doing and how it reflects your life um, so, so incredibly. And, and I think about, <clears throat> I was a music major, and I think about my training as a music major, and of course we have all the genres from Baroque and Renaissance, and, and that's embedded in your education, and I feel like even for recitals and things like that, we were always referring back to that classical period of work, and I'm impressed with how in these three talks that we've had and showcased, it's all about contemporary work and abstract work reflecting your lives and your students' lives and what's happening in the world. Um, is, that, is that different than music, for example, where I feel like we are drawn much, back, much more back to historical pieces and work versus in dance, where it seems like you're very much more focused on contemporary and abstract. How does that, how does that work? That's a really interesting question. I don't know much about music education. I, I would assume that uh, compo educating composers is probably quite different than educating performers. I will say that 
my colleagues are amazing and uh, all of them here in the dance department seem to have a finger on a pulse of, of, of what is happening in the field and are willing to take great risks, great you know, uh, personal risk um, in terms of vulnerability. Uh, I, I think that in most dance departments across the country right now, you would see maybe some similar investigations about how, what's going on with me, what's going on with the people in my life and how, and how is that part of a, a larger framework and, and placing oneself in, within a historical and cultural context. And, you know, of course, coming off the heels of the pandemic and your brighter world piece, we see how that impacted your work as well. Can we talk about that just in a little larger perspective in terms of the pandemic's impact on dance in general? And I'm hearkening back to um, a Facebook or I don't even know it was on Instagram or Facebook where there was an artist out of New York who was doing these single man shows in like a five by seven box, or you probably know what I'm talking about and how I never would have seen that had there not been a pandemic and I was drawn to his work. So can, can you talk a little bit about how you think the pandemic has influenced dance as a whole? There were so many silver linings. It, it, it first, the, the crisis felt Colossal. Uh, I was dance department chair at the time, and so we converted everything online. Um, and I remember having a meeting in the conference room right before campus shut down, being like, "This is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it." Um, and those in the, those initial six to eight weeks, uh, I think, were quite hellish for most movers. Uh, and the it became very very clear all the things we take for granted, being able to share space, being able to move big. Um, with that said, people being able to really turn into themselves and, and work with the resources that they had, people made some really amazing art. And they, um, a lot of us came up with different modes of delivery, um, learn new skills, and thou are distributing their work to much, much larger audiences as a result. When we were back in the studio last fall, and last spring, we were in like 12 by 12 boxes that were taped out. So all of our movement curriculum had to be very constrained and contained. We couldn't even go near each other. And then progressively, the restrictions kind of went away until the point where last fall, when I got to make a return to a brighter world, we were with consent and negotiation, finally touching one another and then literally lifting. They were literally lifting one another. And it was... Uh, incredible to watch as an educator that we have a strong community of students, but being able to witness them finally touching each other and, and having human contact um, with the acknowledgement of everything that had gone, pre that had happened previously to them and having a, a, a deeper appreciation and understanding for having the time, space and community with which to dance. That's so beautiful. That definitely is a silver lining. Thank you. Um, so one last question for you, Kate. So, um, your work has obviously been shared nationally and internationally, um, but, but why UW is one question. Why did you choose to be at UW here? Uh, and then um, also for those teachers that are sharing this talk with their students, like how did you become a dancer <laughs> and a choreographer? Oh. <laughs> well, um, in terms of why UW, I grew up outside of Chicago and in Northern Wisconsin. I, I, um, went to Beloit College, which was a pretty international place. Actually, most of my friends were not from Wisconsin or were from out of the country. And, and I went away to California for uh, five years before coming back to the Midwest for graduate school. But when I interviewed here for the first and last time in my life, I remembered every single student's name. Um, and I felt a, a connection to this, the students here immediately, probably because they're a lot like me and they're Midwestern. Um, they were highly intelligent. Um, and inquisitive, and it felt like home, quite sincerely, it, it, it felt like home. Um, my parents at the time were living up north still, so it, it, it made sense, and I never really, um, it was one of those intuitive decisions that I didn't have to make a pros and cons list, which is like, yep, this is where I'm going to be. Uh, this campus is uh, extremely generous in terms of research support across all fields, so as compared to many of my colleagues at other institutions uh, through WARF, I have been able to really progress my work with um, a, a lot of investment and that is uh, unparalleled, I believe, Absolutely. anywhere else on campus. So that has um, been what's kept me here. And Madison is, is a lovely place to live and a lovely place to raise a family, like not in January or February, otherwise, you know, it's great. 
And in terms of how I became a dancer, I, um, I did not dance as a child. I did a lot of other things and um, was a bit of a geek, a bit of an academic, uh, but I stumbled into a dance class at Beloit College. I was a theater, theater major at Beloit College and I had a very supportive professor named Chris Johnson who created an environment in which um, people with no training and, and, a, and a lot of um, interest and um, you know, may, may, maybe a, a little, little, little bit of basic talent um, could, could really dig into movement. And I was most excited about choreography. As an, an actor, I, did, I didn't feel satisfied or um, even as a director, I would anticipate, I wouldn't have felt satisfied interpreting the work of other people. Uh, the thing I loved most about choreography is to be able to generate something from nothing, to have an idea, that crazy idea and say, hey, I want to look at this. Let's let's make a dance about this together in collaboration. And to me, that's really exciting. And not an athlete necessarily. I have found that a career in dance has um, allowed me to have a fully sustainable, healthy life that otherwise I think would be a challenge for me if I didn't, if I wasn't able to go to the studio and be forced to go to the studio in order to prepare my classes. Uh, in the podcast with Ben, you had mentioned sort of a, a simple way you describe what you do to people that I thought was quite humorous. Could you share that? Yeah, I say that I have a terminal degree in rolling around on the floor and crying and that I'm an expert in rolling around on the floor. Um, <laughs> in, in dance, particularly in contemporary dance, we do spend a lot of time in low space, which is great. Actually, I, I feel like um, in an emergency situation, I could stop, drop and roll and that I, I do have <laughs> an important relationship with gravity. Um, and I, I feel that if, you know, everyone in our society spent some time really, you know, contemplating uh, their, their basic movement and in, in relationship to gravity, that we'd have a lot less problems. That's lovely. Uh, we do have a question posted by William Schmitz, who's asking, how is performance and art evaluated in a dance program? Oh my goodness, that's an incredible question. And assessment is a large topic right now in our department and across the country. Uh, and I, I think there are many, many different approaches. I uh, personally am really looking at progress and metacognition. So uh, are my students aware of how they're learning and are they, they're, are they tracking their development and are they, are they making steps? Are they progressing? Are they getting stronger? Um, I think that very, you would get different responses about assessment from um, each individual. And I, and I think it's challenging. And I would say that it's one of the least favorite parts of my job is having to put a letter grade on, on students' physical and uh, specifically creative work. It's their, the metrics are highly subjective and a moving target, it seems. Thanks for that question. Thank you. And uh, we don't have time to discuss it in detail, but thank you for all of your outreach work also with the schools and the youth uh, around Wisconsin. Um, I'm again impressed with that and the work of your colleagues in that arena as well. And it's so needed. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks, Fran. Great. Thanks for joining us today and for wrapping up this wonderful series showcasing the UW Dance Department. Kate Corby, thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. So the June series of Badger Talks Live, we're going to be honoring Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. And uh, we will be showcasing three talks in the month of June. June 28th, Sterling Johnson, professor in the Department of Medicine, is going to be talking about one of the largest Alzheimer's studies um, that he has been uh, working with. Uh, June 21st at noon, we're going to be talking about family caregiver burnout with Jody Craner from the Dementia Diagnostic Clinic Network Manager, that is her title. And then on Thursday, June 9th, which is the next talk at noon, we're going to be talking to Maria Mora Pinson, who's an assistant scientist, and she's going to be presenting a talk in Spanish, and we're going to present that with English subtitles. And she's going to be talking about problems with memory, um, and Alzheimer's disease. So please tune in. Also visit us on badgertalks.wis.edu. You can see the upcoming schedule of talks. You can sign up for our email list. You can see that great podcast with Ben Rush and all the past episodes out there. Consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant. And you can also search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff experts who've signed up to give talks 
in communities just like yours around the state. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next uh, Thursday, June 9th. Thank you. Thank you.